Italians still exist with expert and Italian and Italian expert, Dr. Roberto Ruffino. So without more ado, over to you, Roberto. Thank you, thank you. And uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, just a second that I'm maneuvering something here. Sounds good. Fine. Okay, now it works better. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, we are having a session today that has a funny title. Do Italians still exist? Uh, um, actually, as you can see from the two lines under the title, uh, this is not really a universal presentation on all that can be said about Italians, but rather some reflections. Uh, after a conference that we had in Siena a few years ago, whose title was Italy between Europe and Multicultural Society. Um, why this title? Well, first of all, you should know that I work for an Italian organization that is called Intercultura, that runs uh, secondary school pupil exchanges between Italy and some 65 different countries all over the world. And obviously, when you're dealing with young people of so many different nationalities, uh, the issue of how you present your own country is a very crucial one. It's a crucial one for the students, Italian students who are going abroad, who have to be prepared to give presentations about Italy. And it's even more crucial for the foreign pupils who are coming to Italy for a school year and will have to be introduced to our country. And then the question immediately is, what is our country today? Uh, worldwide, there are traditional views of Italians. We will go over that quickly soon. But uh, are these uh, let's say, general images of Italy, realistic or not? Do they reflect the situation of today or not? Uh, what do Italians think about themselves, especially at a time when Italy is sort of squeezed between two phenomena, which are social, political, but also cultural phenomena, very important ones, one being the progressive unification of Europe, where values and behaviors of other parts of Europe inevitably have an influence on Italians. And on the other side is the heavy migrations uh, that have been going on in the last uh, 20 years, where uh, millions of people from uh, Africa, from the Middle East, uh, from Asia, and in some cases from Latin America, have actually come into the country to stay here, work here, make their life here. And they too, of course, had an influence on Italy. So migrations in Europe are two uh, massive elements that had an influence on Italy today. So it's reasonable to ask, what is Italy today? And um, I have been asked <laughs> by the, our conductor to, to have uh, a small presentation of myself. Uh, now is not I, the time for modesty, Roberto. Tell us who you are, please, please. <laughs> I, I picked these three pictures. Uh, one uh, very formal, one much less formal, and the other one in between more familiar. Uh, I have been working for, for this organization, Intercultura, now for 45, 46 years. As I have been involved with this issue of international education with cultural exchanges all of my life. And uh, I have done so at two different levels. The one that you see reflected on the picture on the, on the bottom left side is working with the European institution, the Council of Europe, the European Union on issues that had to do with intercultural education ever since uh, and the union has started programs like Erasmus and others on, on pupils and student mobility. Uh, of course, the kind of expertise that we had in this field was 
was useful also for the European institution. You see in that picture, I'm sitting with uh, Jan Figel, who was the European Commissioner for Education until a couple of years ago. But most of my work has been within the, our organization, which is a voluntary organization made of thousands of volunteers, over 4,000 only in Italy and tens of thousands all over the world. And this is where the picture on the right hand side is coming from, who are donating their time, their energies uh, to develop a more international and intercultural approach to schooling through the mobility of young people. And the picture that you see in between is me at home with a chef uh, ape in front of it because I like cooking very much. So I thought I would uh, have a picture of myself as a cook. I live out in the countryside, uh, just a few miles outside of Siena, between Siena and Florence. So I think that's enough for today, don't you think so? <laughs> that's great, thank you. May I? May I move on to Absolutely. actually the topic? Okay, so after this short presentation, um, let's move on to the topic about the Italian identity. Um, most people, even Italians, uh, but surely this is true for foreigners, uh, today don't realize that uh, Italy as a nation is a very recent construction, is a construction of the, of the 19th century. Uh, there has always been uh, um, a strange situation by which on one side, Italy was perceived as an entity ever since uh, the Roman times and later at the end of the Middle Ages, uh, but more as a cultural construction. So Italy, was known for its arts, uh, music, poetry, and in fact, our oldest national poet, Dante, talks about Italy as if it were almost a unity, and he lived in the 13th century. So uh, there is a cultural tradition that puts, uh, that figures Italy as some sort of a unity. But politically, Politically, the construction of Italy really started only in the middle of the 1800s. And uh, the perception of Italy as a nation is actually a consequence of, of uh, the spiritual movements of the late 1700s, uh, the ones connected with the French Revolution, or with Romanticism, with Sturm und Drang in Germany. When, when the idea of building a nation of individuals who had common linguistic and cultural traditions became very popular in Europe. So you actually uh, see that uh, uh, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, the idea of, of an, an Italian identity is something still very vague and it is associated with the political idea of starting to unify the different pieces of the country that until that time had existed as separate states, uh, as separate to a certain degree nations. So there's this fragmentation of the idea of Italy that goes all over its history until 150 years ago. And uh, if you look at how Italy was seen by foreigners in those uh, decades, at the end of the 1700s, in the early 1800s, you see that there's an increasing interest for Italy, but it's a diverging interest. On one side, uh, um, there are lots of stereotypes about the Italians, uh, since we are uh, speaking through, through <laughs> A UK institution today, for instance, there's a famous novel by Anne Radcliffe uh, called The Italians, uh, published in 1786, uh, which draws a sort of a dark image of Italy, something between uh, a Pope-dominated Machiavellian type of country, a country of intrigues, a country of uh, dark lobbies. Uh, and on the other side, you have the many travelers uh, who made Italy 
the destination of their grand tour for their education, most famous of them, Goethe, Italianische Reise, uh, who see Italy as the, end, the land of art, uh, of, of great uh, musical and cultural traditions. Uh, so you have this ambivalence, but when it comes to country, Italy as a nation, the statements that you hear around Europe are very derogatory. At the end of the wars of Napoleon at the Congress of Vienna in 1815, Prince Metternich, Austrian, defines Italy a purely geographic expression. It's a piece of Europe, it's a piece of the geography of Europe. It has nothing to do with the country or with the nation. And this uh, statement is found also in other uh, politicians of the eight, early 1800s. So what we find in Italy in the first half of the 19th century is this attempt to imagine a future of Italy as a unified nation, bringing all these different states together. And there are all kinds of, of, of theories, you know, from unifying Italy under the spiritual leadership of the Pope. There was a uh, philosopher called Gioberti who was uh, putting forward this theory or making Italy some kind of a federation of states. Another political philosopher, Cattaneo, was promoting that idea or making Italy a republic. Uh, this was more the idea of Mazzini that you may be aware of in, in England since he lived mostly in London. And finally, uh, not the theory, but the fact that, that prevailed was the unification of Italy as a kingdom under the monarchy of Savoy, who were the kings of North uh, Western Italy. And so Italy was finally unified between 1860 and 1870 on the political ground as a country with one government from the Alps all the way down to Sicily, but surely it was not unified as a nation. The first uh, minister of education of United Italy in 1861, a certain man called D'Azeglio, repeated the famous sentence, now, we have made Italy, now we have to make the Italians. And this issue of making the Italians, giving a sense of national identity to these people who have been divided for hundreds of years in different uh, small states, probably still an issue today. As a reaction to separatism, to, to, to the fragmentations of the previous century, we see that in the decades that followed the unification in Italy, there is a strong movement towards nationalism. And uh, there was not much national past that people could rely on in those decades. Uh, they had to go very way back to find a time when Italy played an important role internationally. And in fact, we see emerging slowly, little by dear, the idea that the model, the role model for the new nation should be the old Roman Empire. So we should not be uh, surprised that, that after World War I, when uh, Mussolini takes over the government of the country and establishes a relationship Rome and the old idea of Rome, the, 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 the Mediterranean Empire, is somehow revisited and revived for political purposes uh, as uh, a mission for the future, as it had been an example in the past. And so all of, of the, the period that goes from World War I uh, until World War II is dominated by this uh, fascist ideology of uh, Rome reviving the old days of the Roman Empire. As you all know, Italy lost the war, was left in shambles, destroyed, and the age uh, that followed the last uh, 60 years uh, have been an age of trying to establish a parliamentary democracy in the country. 
a true parliamentary democracy had really never existed in Italy. In the old parliaments uh, at the end of uh, the 1900s, not uh, all the Italians were voting, women were not voting, only the rich people were voting. It was more of, a, of a, an aristocracy than a, than a democracy as we mean it today. And so this has been the construction of the country in the past 60 years. An, establish, an attempt to establish finally also in Italy a parliamentary democracy. But many times people don't appreciate the, the, that many of the troubles that we still have today with the identity of our own country come from this troubled and recently unified history that has taken the pathway of a parliamentary democracy only two generations ago. That's, that is amazing, isn't it? And guys, if you've got any comments or questions, just type those out. If we get some good stuff, any questions for that or the historical piece, feel free. And then we can do something there. Someone's voting. So if you type that in the question box, that's a good idea. Okay, that, that might take a bit. I tell you, uh, Roberto, why don't we go on to the next bit and then we can sum some of these questions up as they are typed in. How does that sound? Okay. Great. Now, having made this preamble, um, I would like to go back to the, our conference in Siena and I repeat once more, this is not the truth about Italy today. These are some conclusions that were drawn by a little over 200 people that met in Siena for three days at the university, you know, people coming from politics, uh, from uh, history of religion, from economy, from uh, pedagogics, uh, from different ways of life in Italy, trying to reflect together on what makes the Italian identity today. So the conclusions of the conclusion of these 200 people are not any, any final truths about this country. In those three days, uh, we avoided uh, talking about certain Italian traits which are just uh, uh, too obvious and too internationally known. Of course, uh, uh, a typical trait of the Italian is the fact that we speak Italian. Although I would not take that uh, uh, as a connotation for all Italians. I mean, when Italy was unified, Less than 20% of the Italians spoke Italian at home. And even today, most Italians have two languages. One is the national language, which has been widely diffused only since the days when we have the radio and the television so that the same language arrives in all of the homes of the Italians. But before, most people spoke dialects at home and still most of us are bilingual. We speak Italian when we are in a formal situation or when we are with people from other parts of Italy, but we speak our local language at home. And this is one of the divisive characters of Italy that still remains. I was born in Northern Italy, in Torino, and I bet you if I'm talking my own dialect with someone from Naples or from San Sicily or from Sardinia, I would not understand them and they would not understand me. So they are not so similar. They're really different languages that never develop into a national language. The only one that developed in the national language is the dialect of Tuscany. So what we call today Italian is actually the dialect of Tuscany that over the centuries became the national language of the whole country. And of course, uh, Italy uh, is known for its art, uh, for its landscape, uh, it's known uh, for its food. Uh, today, especially in the last 50, 60 years, it has been known for its design, for its fashion, and for its participation in sports, especially football or soccer, depending on how you want to call that. But basically, uh, we, we, we said in our session that these are fairly obvious. Today, it's not so popular to use the image of the iceberg to, to describe the culture. In fact, many people think that's a horrible way to describe the culture. But anyway, uh, 
we, if we want to make some distinction between the more visible and the less visible aspects of a culture, I would say that obviously language, art, uh, landscape, uh, food, design, fashion, and these other things belong to the visible aspects uh, of culture. And we wanted to concentrate more on the less visible aspects of the Italian culture. And also, we did not want to concentrate on aspects of Italian culture today, which are common to many other European and non-European countries. And mainly two came to our mind immediately. Globalization has impacted, of course, as the world says, has impacted the whole world. So it's not a typical Italian phenomenon. So this crisscrossing of uh, cultural influences is general in the world. And unfortunately, a new rise of xenophobia uh, is also another element that we find in Italy as well as in many other countries today. It's, if we are looking at the European elections uh, coming up uh, one month from now, we see that one of the great fears is that uh, a considerable portion of the European Parliament will actually be occupied by parties that stand for xenophobic principles. So we, we should always keep these considerations in the back of our mind, but I don't spend time on them because they are in no way typically Italian. They belong uh, to a much uh, uh, wider geographical and political scene. So <clears throat> we said, let's concentrate on something that is more typically Italian and that is less visible. If we take the iceberg, something that is under the surface of the water. And we came up with six areas that we identified as being under the surface and that we called the uh, with his name, such as you see here, Pinocchio, loyalty to clans and families, loyalty to local rather than national entities, a diffused acceptance of illegality, a certain type of pagan Catholicism, and the natural orientation toward the past. And I would like to spend most of my presentation on this uh, six points, if it's okay with you. Wonderful, thank you. May I go ahead from here? Roberta, you're in charge, it's good, good, good. Okay, so let's go on and take them one by one. Pinocchio. Uh, you may know, uh, it has been translated in almost all languages, you we know that Pinocchio is a novel that was written by a certain Italian author called Collodi between 1881 and 1883. So 20 years after the unification of Italy. Pinocchio uh, has been in many ways taken as a symbol of Italy of its own times, but also of Italy of all times, also as it is today. And it, Pinocchio is so much uh, a symbol of this country that we invited as a keynote speaker at our conference in Siena, Suzanne Stewart Steinberg, who teaches Italian culture and language at Brown University. We invited her for two reasons. First of all, because she's not Italian. So she could give an outsider view on our country. And also because a year before she had published a most interesting book called The Pinocchio Effect, where she studies the anthropological development of Italians between the unification of Italy, 1861, and World War I. <clears throat> and made the Pinocchio more or less a symbol of that age. Why a symbol of the Italians of that age? Well, uh, the easy answer, of course, is that Pinocchio uh, is presented as a joyful character, childish, 
rather irresponsible, very undisciplined, which seem to be characteristics that could be easily associated with Italians. The identity of Pinocchio is defined by his flaws, flaws, not by his merits, not by his good qualities. He's always on the wrong side of things. He some way, somehow wishes to emancipate. He wishes to uh, go beyond his status of being a puppet. And in fact, at the end of the story, at the end of the novel, he is humanized. He becomes a real human being. He becomes a child. Now, looking at the story of Pinocchio from a more anthropological uh, angle, we see that somehow he reflects uh, what uh, Suzanne Stewart calls uh, an anxious sense of modernity. He's somewhat uncertain about his identity. Should, be, should he remain a puppet? Or should he become a human being? For a certain part of the story, he's directed by others. He's directed <clears throat> by the carpenter who built him. <clears throat> but then at the end, he becomes autonomous. He becomes a human being. So he seems to be reflect uh, this trait of the Italian personality, which, who is always uncertain about his own identity, about the future. There is an Italian expression that says, piangersi addosso, that means crying over oneself, you know, always seeing the miseries of oneself rather than the positive sides, and of having a sense of anxiety about the present and the future, which seems to be reflected somehow in the character of Pinocchio. So uh, this is uh, one of the six elements uh, that the uh, conference picked uh, to define Italian identity. Italians uh, in the end of the 1800, but also today, somewhat have remained uh, a little bit like Pinocchio. Any questions on this point? Roberto, uh, we'll, we'll come back to something there. One on the broader Italian side, so I'll just read it out because it's perfectly formed from Joe in Ireland. Could Roberto comment on the Italian diaspora? So the people uh, who would now call themselves Italians, particularly in the United States and Argentina, and it's really how strongly do they identify with Italy, things Italian, do they see themselves as Italian? Would you have a comment in terms of, you know, when they went or what they think about themselves? Do you think that fits with the history of the making of Italy? Uh, yes, I think that this links very well with the second point. Uh, Italy, to a large extent, uh, has uh, remained a country of loyalties to clans and families. Once I traveled to Australia, because I had been invited to give a number of presentations uh, in some Australian institutions. And at the same time, I was also invited to give some talks uh, in clubs of Italian immigrants. People have been there for 50, 60 years. What interested me and what I found also in other places uh, in Canada and to a certain degree also in Argentina is that you did not have <coughs> the Italian club. You had the Sicilian club, you had the club of Calabria, you had the Napolitan club, the Piedmontese club, the Abruzzi club. Uh, I would refer to this a little later when I, I talk about local loyalties, but in some way I think that the link has been more with the place where their families were coming from rather than to the country as a nation. 
of course, of course, uh, when you are abroad, whether it was 80 years ago or now, you are pushed into being a national of your country. In other words, foreigners see you, first of all, as an Italian. They don't see you as a Sicilian or a Piedmontese because they don't even know the difference between Piedmontese and Sicilian. So they see you as an Italian. So the effect of the surrounding environment is such that people start sometimes feeling more Italians when they are abroad than when they were in their own country. But if you actually look a little more in depth among the emigrants, the Italian emigrants in different parts of the world, <coughs> you see that the actual link was more with the region where the family lived and where they, they came from, rather than with the country as a whole. I don't know whether that answers your question, but this is my impression. That's nice. We, do, we have to quick, quickly get in a joke from France. An old joke is that an Italian, uh, an Argentinian or an Argentine is an Italian who speaks Spanish and thinks he is British. Oh, yes, I heard that. <laughs> rather sweet, rather sweet. I'm not sure about thinking to be British, but anyway. <laughs> um, on this, on this slide, so, um, I, on this slide, I'm a, a bit torn because I don't want to, to meet the, uh, the old stereotype, you know, that we are all family people. This is not true. The concept of families in Italy has changed considerably. Uh, just like in the rest of Europe, you find families of all types. Gay marriages are not legal yet, but they will come soon. Uh, many people have divorced in Italy like they have divorced in other European countries, they have remarried. So the situation is not exactly the one that you can see in the picture. The patriarchal family has disappeared also in Italy. But the link, meaning families and clans are not so much as, uh, you know, the traditional family, father, mother, grandmother, and whatever, but, but family as groups or clans that share common interests. It can be a sport clan, it could be a political clan, it can be an economic clan. And for sure, uh, the loyalty to your group in Italy is still prevailing uh, over the interest, the national interest or the loyalty to the country. There is a strong sense of individualism that feels diluted in the national context and instead feel appreciated within smaller contexts that share common interest. So uh, I will say something later on about the weak national identity of the Italians. And this indeed uh, is the, the flip side of the coin. Uh, in a place where you have a weak national identity, you need to have a sense of belonging to something else. And surely groups, clans, families are prevailing over larger interests. Probably on this uh, family link also had a strong influence. Uh, the fact that uh, until a few generations ago, the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church had a strong influence on the social habits of the country. And of course, uh, the family has always been very much at the core of the interest uh, of the Catholic Church. I would like to move on now from the second uh, uh, characteristics to a third one, which is strictly connected with that and has to do with uh, being loyal to the local rather than to the national. Uh, I will, while I was talking to Michael the other day, I was saying, when you ask an Italian, where are you from? Most likely he will tell you, I am from Milan, I am from Florence, I am from Naples. Uh, meaning that uh, your roots 
are not in the country, your roots are in a specific place in the country where you were born. And you, you keep these roots for the rest of your life. I mean, you will make a move to 10 different places in the country, but when they ask you where are you from, an Italian would reply with the name of the place where he or she was born. Uh, what you see in the picture is a, is a bell tower. We also define Italy among our Italians as the, the country of a thousand bell towers, meaning, meaning that Italians don't feel that they belong to a greater entity, the country, but they belong to the bell tower, meaning the village, the town where they were born, the bell tower being the symbol of, of the place. This uh, loyalty to, to, to the place where you grew up, where you were born, of course, uh, is a consequence of what I was saying before, the fact uh, that uh, only very few actually uh, have a, a sense of, of belonging to the whole country, unless you live abroad, and for the reasons that I was explaining before. But maybe there are also other reasons. If you look at the two predominant philosophical cultures uh, that Italy has had during the 20th century, you see that uh, they're either the religious Roman Catholic philosophy or the Marxist philosophy on the other side. And neither one of them are nationally based. Catholic means universal. And Marxism is universal by nature, it's not limited by country. So the fact that in the last century, these two <coughs> opposing philosophy had a strong influence on Italian uh, organization, on Italian politics, may have stressed a tendency that was there also before, <coughs> of looking more to the place where you grew up, uh, rather than to the country as a whole. Um, also, you know, they make statistics all the time on uh, would you call yourself more a Milanese, uh, a Piedmontese, an Italian, a European, and, and the local denomination is always the one that comes up first, and the Italian one always comes more towards the end. So this is a, <clears throat> a tendency that has been there a long time in the 1900s because of the previous fragmentation of Italy, but it has survived in the 20th century, probably because of religious political influences uh, and also because of the way the country has evolved in the latest generations. May I move on? Absolutely. We've got a couple of comments, but let's uh, maybe, maybe save those up. Thank you, Roberto. Okay, <clears throat> the next uh, point uh, that came up of our discussion in Siena is a very disturbing one for us Italians. Is what I call the diffused acceptance of illegality as part of the national character. Why a diffused uh, acceptance of illegality? probably again because of a weak national identity that does not propose nationally accepted shared values for the population. Probably because of the clan culture which we were talking before, so that if you have <clears throat> a friend in trouble because he has done something illegal, most Italians would choose to defend their friend rather than to defend the legality as stated in the laws of the country. Um, probably because of the familiar family tradition of which we were talking before. But what is uh, a problem in Italy, a serious problem, is the fact that illegality, that of course exists all over the world, in the case of Italy, illegality has always been intertwined with political life. Uh, illegality, as I said, exists everywhere, but it should be, it tends to be a marginal aspect of society. In Italy, illegality has invested the highest level of power 
since the unification of the country. Almost as if uh, the people in power were the legitimate heirs, the legitimate descendants of the old feudal lord. And by the fact of being in government position, in high position, would not be bound to respect the same laws as the people who were the subject in this situation. And what was always troublesome in Italian history in the last 150 years was to turn the subjects into citizens and to ensure that all citizens would be considered at the same level by the authorities. And the authorities would consider themselves as being at the service of the citizens and not above the citizens. So uh, if you look at the history of Italy in the last 150 years, very frequently you see that the illegal behavior was at the, the National Bank of Italy, was in the people who were running colonial wars for the country between the 1800s and the early 1900s, was in the generals who ran uh, the business during World War I, where at the core of fascism, in the very leadership of fascism, and have been involved in a number of scandals from the oil scandals in the 60s to the, uh, you may remember the, the, the age of the Red Brigades in Italy in the 70s and early 80s, the political assassinations. Whenever you dig into these scandals that have run across the uh, United, the history of United Italy, you see that the illegality was not a marginal phenomenon, but was at the core of the government in some areas of the government of the country at the national, regional, or local level. And this sense of illegality has gone hand in hand with the sense that only a strong man can run the country. This explains the fortune of people like Mussolini, and Berlusconi, where uh, the, the more simple uh, approach to politics uh, sees uh, the man in power who can solve the situation. Uh, the perception that uh, parliamentary democracy is really not strong enough to uphold and to defend the, the country from illegality, so you need to have somebody in power who can clean up the situation. There is a sense of, uh, a general sense of low public ethics. Uh, I don't know how many of you have followed the trial of Berlusconi in the last few years, but the fact that after all, what did he do wrong? He did not pay taxes. Something for which you would go to jail for years in other countries, you know, but since the low ethical standards of the country, basically many times think, I wish I could do the same. Maybe the, the, the Catholic tradition has something to do with that, the, the, the easiness with which you can have your sins forgiven through the absolution process that the priest uh, can, can give to the uh, believers. Uh, you know, yes, you can sin, but you can always be forgiven. So this sense of mixture of religious uh, elements with very low ethical standards has created a situation of what I call the diffused acceptance of illegality, which is one of the not so hidden elements of the Italian character today, unfortunately. <clears throat> the next point I would like to touch upon is what I call the pagan Catholicism. Yes, Italy is a Catholic country, but it's more Catholic in rituals than in deep values and behaviors. The Catholicism of Italy, as it is shown in this photograph, 
is uh, a Catholicism of saints and Madonnas. And the, if you look a little more in depth, uh, you see that the situation has not changed very much from the old uh, pagan religion of the Romans, where each village, each town had at least one patron god or patron hero that would be the protector of the town and where there was a diffused uh, wor worship for what we call the great Mediterranean mother, this goddess mother that was uh, spray shedding his, uh, her uh, motherhood over the population. Now, if you translate this, you see that instead of the patron hero, patron god, now you have patron saints. And instead of the goddess mother, you have the Madonna, the Virgin Mary, worshipped with many, many different names that make her almost different persons from place to place. So much of the rituals, much of the identification of church life with ceremony, with rituals, and with a sense of ownership by the local community through a patron something has survived at the end of paganism and has been translated into Catholicism. You actually have towns in Italy where on the occasion of the festivity of the patron saint, they perform exactly the same rituals and ceremonies that the old Roman historians uh, describes happening at their times in honor of some local god. So where the translation from one religion to other has passed almost inadvertently. There is a lovely church in southern Italy where on the main altar of the Catholic Church there is a statue of Juno with a pomegranate in her hands. Juno with a pomegranate was a symbol of fertility. And now the Mary, the Virgin Mary is called the Mary of fertility, the Mary that protects the mothers to be. So there's this compenetration between the old pagan religion and Catholicism, which has been reinforced by the fact that the church has played such a relevant political role in the history of the country throughout its 2000 years. Uh, until 150 years ago, the Pope was actually a king and he was actually a political ruler of central Italy. So the church has identified so much with political life, just as pagan religion was identified with political life, the head of the pagan quote unquote church was the emperor himself. So this identification in many ways has contributed to a certain uh, survival of paganism under the dress of Catholicism. And finally, the last point that, that came out of our discussions in Siena is the fact that Italians show a national orientation towards the past. If you, if you happen to come to Italy and you go to a town where you have never been before and you are uh, the guest of uh, a local family, uh, most likely within 24 hours, as soon as you are washed and relaxed, someone from the family will take you out and will take you to visit the cathedral, the baptistry, and a few other remains from the past. And if you ask your host, why did you take me there? The answer will be because it's important. And if you ask them why it's important, it's important because it's important. Obviously, it belongs to the past, so it's important. It's part of our memory. It's part of our heritage. But how does this relate to you today? Hmm. No answer. There's this sort of um, um, 
unconscious uh, reference to the past as being the reason why today we are what today. But it's also a situation that reflects uh, maybe the fact that Italians need some sort of comfort, of consolation for the situation in which the country is today. And it's like those noble families who participate in the Crusades and today they just own, own a little uh, chalet with a couple of acres of land and all the rest is gone and they keep on talking about the Crusades and their ancestors. Maybe there's something of that uh, in the character of the Italians without them really thinking of it or knowing of it. The fact that there's such a low national identification with the country today, the fact that there's such a level of anxiety uh, about modernity, about the future, as we were saying half an hour ago when we talked about Pinocchio, all this conspires uh, to, to make them more look at the past, uh, which was so great, so glorious, so powerful, rather than dwelling on today, on the future, rather than on having visions of the years to come. And this that you see in the picture is in fact one of the very many local festivals that happen in Italy. This actually is happening in my hometown every year in July and you see these people wearing medieval dresses when in fact this town, which today is a non-entity, was an important fortress and played an important role in the history of Siena. Having said this, uh, um, I sort of, you know, sum up in a way, uh, this does not cover, of course, everything that one can say about Italians today, but the attempt was really to look at some aspects which are not so immediately evident. This sense of anxiety about modernity that we can see in Pinocchio, this uh, loyalty to, to your local groups, clans, uh, families, more than to society in general, your loyalty also to the place where you are born, where you come from, rather than to the country. The fact that uh, there is a diffused acceptance of illegality, rather low public ethical standards in the country, a religion that is ready to excuse uh, and to um, uh, forgive easily uh, about sins and of frequently overruns roles that should not be uh, taken by the church, like the political role, which all leads uh, in the country to a rather natural orientation more towards the past than toward the future. Roberto, thank you, thank you, thank you. Can I go and uh, make a couple of, uh, or put some sort of questions to you about the sort of the six chapters, is that okay? Sure. The Pinocchio thing, you mentioned emancipation, so should this person be on the end of a string, or should they be a human, and you talk about democracy, and I just think, just to, to, a little bit of contrast, America, Russia, UK, at that time, 1860, 1870, 1880, were changing from slavery to a different form of commerce. So serfdom under the feudal. Did, do you recognize that as a system that would have been the past in Italy as well? So a feudal system, so there was the liberation of the peasant, do you think that's a similar thing that was happening in Italy at that time? Uh, not so much. Um, the socialist movement uh, started in Italy in the 1890s uh, and did contribute uh, to a certain degree to the emancipation of the rural population. Uh, we have, of course, should remember that at the turn of the century, over two thirds of the Italian population were farmers. Yeah. And there was not, a, the industry were not so developed as they were, for instance, in England or in Germany. And therefore, uh, the, the, 
the, the influence of, of uh, socialist movements on rural population was much less than in, than in other parts of Europe because these were simply people that were working in isolation. It's easier to build up a political movement when people are in a factory and when they, there are hundreds of people working together. So this uh, type of emancipation happened in Italy much more slowly. Although it did happen to a certain degree, especially in the big cities in the north, in Turin, in Milan, in Genoa, yeah. and a few other places. And Mussolini himself started as a socialist. Uh, then he had a big conversion, but uh, his original uh, political movement that he belonged to was a socialist movement. But the, the transformation from rural to industrial society was much, much more slowly, it happened much more slowly in Italy. And uh, as a result, uh, when Italy entered World War I, it was much more of a rural society compared to other Central and Northern European countries. And uh, this facilitated uh, the takeover of fascism at the end of the war because there was not such a strong opposition in the country that would come from other organized movements. Actually, there were strong opposition by the socialists. The Christian Democrats were not really organized yet. So it, it, the, the, dictate, the takeover by dictatorship was much more easy. Thank you. Thank you. Put that into context. Uh, a lighter one from France. What about a mammoni? The Italian government is giving out cash to thousands of Italians to leave the home of the mother so that they could start to live on their own. Eight out of ten Italians aged under 30 still live at home. So this is getting back to family and clan. Yeah, yeah. It's a stereotype, but do you have a comment upon it? Well, sure. I mean, that's why I put family among the... the uh, the elements of the Italian character. Uh, the, the family is the biggest social security plan for Italy, <laughs> in the sense uh, that uh, uh, although today, as I was saying before, families are evolving, nonetheless, when you are in trouble, family is there. And sure enough, in Italy today, where 40% of the young people below the age of 30 are not employed, the fact that they rely on their parents, on the income of their parents, and live with them is, yep. is a way, is, is a way of social protection in a way. And uh, it, it comes very natural. It is not felt as uh, something out, out of the world, something totally unnatural. If you don't have a job, you obviously rely on your parents. Uh, and and uh, the same is even true with, uh, with the generation of grandparents. Uh, there are some grandparents who are still helping with their grandchildren, with their yeah. pension, when their grandchildren are unemployed. So these family links in this sense of economic solidarity, which is also implies yeah. also human solidarity, this is still very strong. Very good. And just a, a, cup, a bit of contrast there. So it would be uh, emotional and financial independence, which, which was the bigger push in Northern Europe. But because of house prices and economic stresses from 2008, yes. we're getting the, the Italian phenomena happening elsewhere as well. Yes. Uh, I, I would really make a, draw a line here. You know, until 30, 35 years ago, uh, it was almost immoral uh, to sort of uh, go and, and make your own life independently of your family. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I'm now 73, so when I graduated from, from university almost 50 years ago, I told my parents who were living in Torino that I would look for a job in Rome because I wanted to live in Rome. And this was, was considered by my parents almost as immoral. Because if someone is born and grows up in Torino, where, uh, which is one of the wealthiest uh, cities in Italy, where there were plenty of job opportunities, yeah. why would someone want to go to Rome? <laughs> this makes no sense. It made no sense 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we are passed from that situation where family solidarity and unity was, was much stronger, even in the cities and not just in rural environment, to a situation today where 
if people have the opportunity, what those who have the opportunity to go, they go, they travel, they move to other places, they go abroad. There are lots of Italians, uh, unfortunately, close to, to uh, 80, 90,000 young Italians every year after they graduate from university from college, they go and work in other countries because they don't yep. find a job in Italy. And they do that rather than remaining unemployed. But there are a large number who do not have the same level of education, who do not have the same opportunity, who do not speak foreign languages, who do not find a job. And, and for these people, uh, yeah, family is a social security. Absolutely. That sounds good. Um, almost a comment. When we did the run through, we did the contrast again between, say, Britain and Italy. So Italy would say, uh, you know, the taxation, I don't need to pay my taxes, but I will look after my uh, grandparents or parents. Britain would act in a fairly shameful way uh, towards the grey haired population, but never think of not paying their taxes with a few famous exceptions, like, uh, like some MPs. So there's almost an opposite culture there. Yes, yes, the, the tax issue is a very severe one in Italy. Look, look at Berlusconi. He has been sentenced to four years of jail because he has not paid hundreds of millions of euros of taxes. And, and then uh, he, he still hasn't gone to jail now. He would probably never go to jail. And, and, and the thing is dragged on. And, and there's a consistent number of people in Italy, probably close to eight or nine million, who would still vote for him if we had an election in Italy. Because, uh, well, what's wrong about not paying taxes, you know? He's <laughs> lucky he got, he got out of that. I would do the same if I could. But this is still a very severe problem. Yeah, it's, it, it's tough, which is about confidence and other things. OK, uh, tough one here. Uh, brace yourself, Roberto. Speaking of beautiful Siena, any comments about the report or rumor that the town or the region is is now bankrupt thanks to a little bit of illegality? <laughs> no one's accusing you, Roberto. No one's accusing you. The town is not bankrupt. It's the bank. It's another thing. <laughs> oh, the Monte Paschi did Siena. Okay. Now, Siena, the main industry of Siena is a bank which, by the way, is also the oldest bank in Europe. Uh, the bank is called Monte dei Paschi di Siena and was founded in 1472, so 540 years ago or something. Well, uh, the bank is owned partly by the private sector and partly by a foundation that was created some 30 years ago. And it was actually the foundation that was almost bankrupt, not the bank, uh, which is a tragedy for the city because it was the income of the foundation that was actually funding lots of cultural activities in Siena, yeah. from the more known one like the Palio, to the university, to the local hospital, to museums, to a number of other things. And the fact that the foundations, for reasons that would be too long to, to, to explain now, has almost gone bankrupt means that for years and years to come, there will be no dividend, uh, no money from the foundation for cultural activities in Siena. So it will be the hospital, it will be the university, it will be the contradas, it will be a number of institutions in Siena that will actually suffer. Not the bank, because the bank um, has had its ups and downs, but it's actually recovering now. But in the old days, the bank belonged 100% to the foundation. So it was, in a way, the property of the city. In order to save the foundation, the foundation was uh, obliged to sell most of the shares of the bank. And so rather than being able now to have 100% of the surplus of the bank to share with the city every year. Now it's down to only 5% of the property yeah. of the bank. So only 5% of the surplus of the bank will be shared, a very minimal part compared to what the city was used to. So this is where the problem lies. But the bank will be okay. 
a source of pain. Thank you for the for the update there. Um, interesting point. We'll just do this quickly. Isn't politics a national passion of Italy, although there is maybe a lack of national attachment? So do you think it's a sport, a national passion? Oh, good question. Um, in a way, yes, uh, but uh, the, the knowledge, uh, it's a passion without knowledge. Uh, Italians, in general, do not read uh, many newspapers, uh, uh, tend to get only the knowledge they have about politics is from the news, from a few minutes of news on television, neither those who watch it. So you have uh, basically different groups of politically passionate. You have the older generation that is politically passionate in an ideological way. I mean, you have the ones who have always been for Marxist parties, the socialists or communists, who still believe that that philosophy would be the solution for it. You have the ones who have always been very devout to church goers and believe that the Christian Democrats or people of Catholic inspiration should be the ones who should uh, dictate the national policy. You have the ones who follow the new leaders, the ones they would like to imitate, like Berlusconi's party, who have been very successful in his business, has inspired a number of Italians to say, oh, if he would actually lead the country, then we would be okay, because like he has been able to lead his business, he would be able to lead his country, which has not happened. But none the way, you have people who are not ideologically, but are personality-oriented. Personality and sure enough, you fairly often hear Italian talking about politics. But when you grasp a little bit under the surface, you also see that most of them are rather disinformed and have only yeah. very superficial knowledge about what is going on. Thank you. Uh, we've got more on the illegality. Uh, there is no real unemployment benefit in Italy, thanks to all the tax invasion. Uh, and there's more 30 percent tax evasion in Italy, less schools, less roads, hospitals and research. Uh, and we also know the uh, the mafia activity leads to poor infrastructure and so forth. So the part these are the sort of comments uh, or statements. So you can there's a couple of them. I just chuck out a couple and then you can comment. Past for Italians is seen as the family jewels to be shown to the visitor. Footballers, sports people, professionals, traders, all evade tax. Now, there is that point, that sort of celebrity tax evasion. And if you have a reaction to that. <laughs> well, the tax evasion, okay. 90% of the income of the Italian government comes from people who are employed or have a pension, 90% because uh, the tax money is withheld from your monthly salary or pension check. So you don't even see that money. Whenever I receive my monthly salary, it, the, the tax has already been deducted and paid by the company. Yeah. So obviously, yeah, so people who, have, who are on a salary or on a pension naturally and compulsorily pay their taxes. And only 10% of the Italian uh, government income comes from uh, uh, people who have a shop uh, or lawyers or doctors or other categories of people who are self-employed and where they themselves have to declare their income and pay tax based on their income. Yeah. And that's where you have the largest amount of evasion of taxes. Yeah. And this is where uh, a number of governments have been trying try to concentrate uh, to do something, I must say, not very successfully so yeah. far. Uh, but the, the situation is, is basically one of a total imbalance between people who are employed and receive a fixed amount every month and the people who employ themselves and have to make declare their income uh, and pay their taxes by themselves. Um, there was something else about <clears throat> being unemployed or receiving did you say something about that? Yes, uh, there's, there's, there's little unemployment support or support for the unemployed. Very little, yes, very little. Uh, again, again, uh, you know, one thing is the, the, what appears, the other is the reality. Actually, when people yeah. are laid off, uh, they receive usually up 
to two months, uh, two years of full salary, <coughs> that then goes down to 90 or 80 percent of their full salary. Uh, beyond the, the two years of unemployment, there is no, uh, yeah, no provision. Good. At the moment, the current government is actually working on a provision also for the people who have been employed, unemployed for a longer period of time. Yeah. Um, there, there is no provision for people who have never worked. So if you have never, if you have worked and you are laid off, then you keep on receiving your salary. And usually two years were time yeah. long enough for people to find a new job. For people who have never worked, there is no provision for them yet. And this is what the current government is working on. Uh, we should be able to see some, some uh, new regulations rather soon. Of course, uh, we have to consider that uh, uh, Italy has, acc has accumulated an enormous national deficit over the past 25 years. So uh, having lighter taxation or providing additional money for the unemployed while reducing the amount of accumulated national deficit would be a very big, big task for any government. Absolutely. Here's a fascinating one, and we and time is passing, so I'll make this one of the last couple, um, about uh, immigrants and integration. It would seem that most immigrants would not or could not have any of these identified cultural identities or, or phenomena how could the second or third generation fit in or would they be or are they are they always going to be excluded and if this is the case what is the future of italy no the the, the law on nationality uh, is now being revisited so it will probably change in the next year or so uh, for 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 a long the, the Italian tradition was that you were Italian if, you're, if your parents were Italian. So the blood rule rather than the territorial rule, if you are born in Italy, you are Italian. And now uh, the, the law is that if you, uh, if you immigrate into Italy, you can claim citizenship after 10 years. If you are born in Italy, you have to decide at the age of 18 whether you want to keep the nationality of your parents or uh, assume Italian nationality. The, the, the laws, that are, the bills that are being discussed in Parliament now shorten this period uh, to make it easier to, to acquire Italian citizenship. Now, you should consider that the vast majority of the people immigrating to Italy do not stop in Italy. Um, we have all these hundreds of thousands of immigrants every year simply because we are sort of, of uh, stretching out into the Mediterranean, so we are the closest country to the African shores from where these boat uh, people are coming from. And, uh, but most of the people actually land in Italy. They belong uh, to, to a number of, of, of categories. Uh, well, either legal or illegal immigrants. The ones who um, have political reasons for, for running out of their country can actually stay in Italy. The others, in theory, are supposed to go back. In fact, almost none of them goes back, and they all try to move on to northern European countries. So it's only a percentage of the people who actually land in Italy who find a job and stay here. And the problem uh, seems to be really more for the first four or five years that people spend in the country, because we now have lots of uh, uh, immigrants who have settled in Italy, who have been here for 15, 20, 25 years, who have children born in Italy, and they are integrated in the country. Uh, we just did a research with the University of Milan on second generation uh, immigrants in, in the Lombardy area, and the level of integration is very high, although they're still complaining about this fact of having to wait until they're 18 to get the citizenship. But it's really the issue is with the first generation and for the first years after arrival, especially because if they come into a country where there is such a high level of unemployment, of course, the conflict with the local population, who, right or wrong, believes that they are contributing to this high level of unemployment, is almost inevitable. 
Very good. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, one more. Uh, someone could say it's a light ending. Other people would say it is uh, the modern essence of the Italian brand. So Italians are known for their creativity, their design, their flair, for their fashion, for getting it right. Where do you guess these characteristics come from? <laughs> this is the one million euro question. <laughs> I mean, the you know, certain, things are, certain things are part of, of, of a national tradition. I mean, this, this country uh, has uh, been cultivating uh, the arts, which are the father and mother of design uh, today, as far back as we can remember, and why did it did it happen in Italy and not somewhere else? You know, you have to go back over two thousand years to discuss that. It's very hard to say. But you are right in saying that uh, uh, although it, it's it's quite interesting for us Italian even to, to guess what what happened because if you look at Italy in the 1700s, Italy was. Uh, at the forefront of technological innovation. Uh, you know, Galileo was Italian. Uh, and many other names were, were Italians and, and, and people were studying from, coming from all over Europe to study in Bologna and in other Italian university. Not the arts, but medicine, technology, innovation, mathematics. Uh, what surprises me is how we lost that. You know, that, that sort of, vanish away during, during the 19th and 20th century. But the artistic tradition that has been there with that, that somehow has survived and has created a strange mixture with technology today. So the Italian technology is, uh, that is known in the world and, and fashion is one type of technology in itself. Uh, is a combination, in fact, uh, of, of science and art, uh, of ability to do something in an innovative way and to do it in an artistic fashion. And uh, that's part of the DNA of the population, I guess. I don't think there's a reasonable explanation for that. Wonderful. Okay. I think that's... Uh... That's probably enough, to, uh, more than enough time that we've got uh, for this show. Uh, Roberto, can I, on behalf of the large audience we've got to, to say uh, today, to say a deep, deep thank you for the context you've provided, the fill-in education and information that we all need and you have delivered today. Thank you for your depth. Thank you for your perspective. It's been amazing. You are genuinely a subject matter expert on Italy. And if I may say so, a Renaissance man. So... <laughs> uh, do not generalize. <laughs> I am generalizing like that. Everybody, you should see Roberto's sketches. They're amazing. If I have to give a conclusive thought, I think that... Uh, after all this discussion on what is the Italian identity, I think that especially foreigners should always remember that Italians do not know what is their identity. Good. A friend of mine who, who teaches education science in Milano, I asked her if she could put to her students the question, what did you learn about Italian identity at school? Yeah. And she got 420 answers, but there was no, uh, no conclusive answer to that, meaning that they touched on different points, but people come out of school, go to university in Italy without having a sense of what is their national identity. And I think we should never forget this because actually Italian identity was not even a topic of reflection for the identity until the 80s of the past century. Do you know when we started to talk about Italian identity? Is when we were uh, uh, in some invaded by so many people from other parts of the world, when we had this mass immigration. That's really the first time when Italians started to think uh, in light of all these people coming from other countries, but what is really an Italian after all? Yeah. And, and it was really, political movements like the Northern League that started in the 80s, you know, that put the question of uh, 
who are we? Yeah. What do we want to be? What, what image do we have ourselves? So, and probably because of the fragmentation of our history, because of, of all the diversity that still exists in the country, even language-wise, it's very hard for an Italian to say what an Italian is. So <laughs> I leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. We're out of time, which is a tragedy. Everyone's hanging on. We still have a vast audience, but we really all have to go and do a little bit of work today. Roberto, a deep grazie mille from everybody. And I'm sure uh, Siena uh, um, tourism will spike and people will be knocking on your door <laughs> this summer. So a deep Thank appreciation. You. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Let's see what we do next time. Thank you and goodbye.